so Bert Burrow Flight is uh, affectionately called Bob, and so I say, what about Bob? Uh, Burrow Flight is called Tabakia iwensis. It's a leaf spot disease. Tabakia, tabakia is a common leaf spot disease found on many species of trees. Tabakia dryena is a common leaf spot fungal issue on oak trees. And uh, for a long time, folks thought it was Tabakia draena or some other Tabakia fungus until they identified it as its own species and they called it Tabakia iowensis several years ago. Uh, again, it's a leaf spot fungi, a fairly new issue, uh, obviously with the Iowensis name that uh, really it's a big problem in Iowa, so that's kind of where they identified that it was a new fungus and thus the new name. So a tree on the left is, is a good indicator of late summer what a burr oak light tree might look like. Uh, the picture on the right is a close-up of the leaf that's a very common necrotic or dead area in the leaf that you might see midsummer. But I'll get much more into the symptoms of the tree, uh, symptoms of the disease. It is a limited regional issue, so this isn't, doesn't have national scope. Uh, the picture on the right is where native burr oaks grow, and uh, you can see that it's primarily in the center of the country through Minnesota, down through Missouri, over into Illinois, Indiana, Ohio. Uh, the picture on the left is actually where they have identified burr oak blight, and that is the shaded areas, the shaded counties are actual identifications. And there are a few missing on this picture. I know that it has been identified in Arkansas as well. Um, but you can see that it's limited to about, what is it, six, seven states kind of in the Midwest within the natural um, burr oak, native burr oak range. And, uh, I don't really have it identified on this map, but the uh, picture on the left also is a good outline of where the burr oak, Quercus macrocarpa, oliviformis variety is most common. And I'll get into that in a little bit, but that is where you're going to find burr oak blight most commonly on that variety. Uh, so why is burr oak blight important? Uh, burr oak blight is important because people love burr oak trees. So the picture on the left is uh, a, a nice burr oak, and that's only the 14th largest burr oak in Iowa. And of course, it's, uh, they are very concerned about that tree, that it has some um, burr oak blight symptoms, and so it's a big, big issue. And I'm just using this as an example of the stateliness of these trees and the, the beauty that they provide us. And people are very, very concerned. I've worked with all sorts of landowners uh, on this Baroque blight issue, not just your residential landscape, but also uh, farm farmyards, uh, areas where cattle are, um, you know, areas, very rural areas that people are real concerned about the, 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 the condition of these trees. They don't want them to decline any further. And so uh, I often joke that if emerald ash borer affected burr oaks, people would save every tree because they, they really love the burr oak tree. And uh, so that's why it's a real big issue for, for these folks that it's being affected. And it does seem like it's progressively getting worse. And again, I'll get into that a little bit. But you can see that they planted native prairie around this particular tree just to uh, try to reduce the competition from turf and things like that. That's how concerned they are about the health of that tree. Uh, so again, the host is Quercus macrocarpa, uh, generally it'll affect native burr oaks. Uh, the oliviformis variety is the most susceptible. That's the one with the, the smaller acorns. Of course, the burr oak leaf is uh, in the white oak family, but the burr oak is a very thick leaf, that broad, broad lobe leaf. Uh, it does affect other varieties besides the oliviformis. It also will affect Mr. macrocarpa, but it seems like it affects the oliviformis more uh, than, than the other varieties. Uh, generally naturally established trees. So you get folks that ask about uh, some of the cultivars that are grown in nurseries, even like swamp white oaks and some of these cultivars. And uh, you're generally not going to see too many symptoms of burr oak blight on those. Uh, I, I, it has been known to happen, but uh, generally speaking, it's going to affect the native trees more. Uh, upland sites are generally more prevalent than lowlands, and that could be due to the varieties that are growing there. Um, and so the, the denser stands with larger acorn varieties generally aren't as effective. Again, Tabakia iowensis, this is a polycyclic fungi. In other words, more than one cycle is possible each season. Um, 
I'll get into that a little bit more in depth, but there can be infections at different times of the growing season. Uh, the fruiting, and this is the reason that this disease has really become more prevalent, uh, is the next bullet point there, is that the fruiting bodies of the disease may remain on the tree from year to year on, le on retained leaf petioles. And then, so the reason that's important is because if the spores are right next to next year's expanding leaves, and we have a, say the tree had burrow flight last year, we get a rainy spring this year, and uh, those spores are right next to these emerging soft uh, tender leaves, it really uh, increases the likelihood that that disease is going to spread throughout the canopy of the tree. And that's why we see the disease get progressively worse. For whatever reason, this disease has uh, created an, an ability for to prevent leaf senescence. And so it prevents the leaves from falling off. And then the, the fruiting bodies can be on that leaf petiole. Even if the leaf blows off, the, the fruiting bodies may be on the petiole. And the, petiole, the old petioles right next to expanding leaves, and that's why we see the progression of the disease where it might start minor one year and then develop and get worse year after year. But the spores are also spread by wind and, of course, the rain splashing. And then wetter springs and summers, it, one of the reasons that this disease seems like it's progressively getting a little bit more prevalent is that uh, we've noticed in the Midwest rainfall in the last 20 years. And uh, that might have a real significant issue on development of this disease. In the next slide, I kind of have that indicated. That annual precipitation in the Midwest has been increasing over the last 30 or 40 years. And uh, if you take a, you've got dry years, you've got wet years, but if you take an average, generally speaking, the, the precipitation uh, is increasing. So more, more frequent wet rainy springs and, and wet rainy summers. Um, which, of course, we all know is a real good uh, recipe for, for a pathogen or a disease. Uh, any kind of, anytime you have the host, the pathogen, and conditions like moisture, cool, wet weather, uh, you're going to have spread of disease. Again, symptoms uh, generally begin uh, with lesions on the leaves low in the canopy. Now, this tree may no leaf out just normally, very green, um, and then these lesions that are developed from the spores developing on the leaf uh, develop throughout the summer. And again, it can progress up the crown from year to year. And it may kill the tree after several years. However, more often than not, the disease doesn't kill the tree. It's more often than not that the disease continues to stress the tree to the point where a secondary uh, problem occurs, such as a two-line chestnut bore attack or things like that. The big issue is that the tree just looks terrible mid-summer. And, uh, of course, it's in an area that, uh, you know, people are concerned about the tree, then they don't like that. And the second thing with that is that that does cause a stress on the tree. The tree is not producing food if all the leaves are brown. And so it can get progressively worse, opens up the tree to a secondary. So, again, the tree can leaf out perfectly uh, fine in the springtime, but uh, by midsummer you might see leaves like are in my hand. On the left, and then, of course, close-ups of the, uh, the petiole indicate where the, the spores are, are developed on that petiole. Um, there are two, two different time frames for that disease to develop, and one is in the spring uh, when the leaves are tender and the, and the weather is wet. It can, can develop that leaf spot on the leaf. Those leaves are more likely to stay on the tree, those ones that are affected early in the spring. And if they stay on the tree, of course, then the fruiting bodies are staying on the tree. If you don't have a particularly wet, cool, wet spring, the disease can still develop later in the summer. And this is kind of what we saw last year. Uh, the disease did not seem to be as bad early in the summer. It got worse later. So what happens on those leaves, that the leaf spot may develop even during the summertime, June into July, if you have the right conditions, a cool uh, little cooler and a little wetter, uh, that leaf spot can develop. But those leaves usually turn brown, like our ones in my hand, and then fall off the tree. And so you can have defoliation from that second phase of the disease moving in. Uh, usually the, the spring-affected leaves they are retained on the tree. The summer-affected leaves may fall off the tree. The tree may become foliated. I just kind of put this together to kind of give you just a just a you know a life cycle so to speak. It's not a true life cycle of the disease, but uh, it gives you an indicator of what you might be looking at. So springtime on the left, 
the tree is going to leaf out fairly normally. Uh, that's a fairly early picture, perhaps second week of May, that those uh, bur oaks are all leafing out. And they'll leaf out even if they had bur oak blight last year. They were pretty good in spring. And uh, then those leaf spots will develop. Uh, the necrotic kind of wedge-shaped uh, uh, leaf spot will develop, and the you'll notice the fruiting bodies on the back. And then um, those leaves might be retained on the tree like you see on the right. Uh, secondarily, there may be infection on green leaves that those leaves are falling off the tree. And so you get some defoliation, some, some leaves stay on the tree, and then that progresses through the summer. And so by midsummer, say the bottom right two pictures might be uh, mid-August, and uh, you can see that the trees look really, really bad. In fact, some people have confused these trees as being dead and have removed the tree if they don't know anything about the disease. So. Um, Certainly, if you have any doubts, you can take these uh, uh, freshly, fresh uh, killed leaves or, fre uh, you know, leaves that have both brown and green on them, bring them into a pathology lab here in Minnesota, the University of Minnesota Plant Pathology Lab. They'd take it in and they would culture out the disease if you had any doubt whatsoever. Uh, but that's what you're, you're tending to look at is kind of progressively worse looking trees throughout the summer. And then... Uh, uh, the picture kind of center left in the bottom is a picture I just took yesterday, actually, of a burrow flight tree that has retained leaves. And there were some that had a lot of retained leaves, some that had a little bit. Uh, this late in the winter, and actually it is still winter even though it's April, but we've had some nice days. But uh, uh, this late, usually you've had some winds that blow off the leaves that are retained. Uh, some of them stay on, but the petioles, even if the entire leaf is blown off, the petiole is still on those, those trees. And so that's kind of the life cycle. And what you see, the trees will leaf out fairly normally. The, leaf, the disease will get progressively worse through the summer. And then oftentimes you'll see retained leaves through the winter. Because it's not a real long webinar, I'm going to answer a question that's popped up. I will... Uh, look into the question was, is there any resources for laboratories in Texas for diagnosis of the disease? And I can look into that and answer your question. I don't know. I'm, every state that I work in, and I work in Illinois through uh, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Iowa, the Dakotas, every state does have a plant pathology lab, usually through the university. Uh, but I, I'm not sure in Texas, but I can certainly find out. Um, OK, again. Just to further uh, the whole um, kind of message on these symptoms, again, a tree can look great in the springtime and kind of get progressively worse as you see in those pictures midsummer. I just wanted to share several pictures just so you can see it. Kind of every year can be a little bit different. That dead center picture was last year down in the Okaboji, Iowa, northwest Iowa area. Uh, open grown tree, you would think that it would have good air circulation so it wouldn't have a lot of disease developed. But even there, you can get progressively worse. And so, a uh, picture on the right again, a late season burrow flight tree that has basically almost 100% foliation or brown. So, very, very effective. Uh, so, then there's other stressors. And again, I just mentioned the uh, Okaboji, Iowa area. A lot of oak trees in a fairly compact area of highly developed property. And so it's a lot of baroques. And you're going to find this in a lot of situations, uh, kind of on the rural urban interfaces that people build homes or uh, perhaps recreational property, golf courses, things like that, uh, in areas that, that had native baroque trees. So uh, we know that um, uh, competition, turf management, compaction, high salt fertilizers, all those things can affect the health trees too. So it's not just a, oftentimes uh, just the pathogen causing issues, but there can be other stressors involved that complicate the management of this disease. And oak trees are particularly sensitive to soil compaction, uh, construction, uh, root damage, those kinds of things. And that all complicates how you're going to manage it. And so I guess the message is it's not just a one uh, one one treatment type of solution. It's a multitude of things that you're going to do to kind of improve the overall health of your trees. And uh, so 
looking at competition, looking at the other trees growing in the area, looking at turf establishment of the area, how you manage that turf, then looking at water management. All those different things are coming into play with Purple Lake. Quite honestly, it's not as easy to control as emerald ash borer. Emerald ash borer, you can easily control it with an insecticide treatment and uh, uh, problem pretty much solved. Uh, with rural flight, there can be a lot of different complicating factors. To answer Angel's question, uh, something that we would be seeing in California is not likely that you're going to see um, bur oak blight in California. It's just not a not, lot of native bur oaks. There are other uh, live oak issues that I'd be happy to, to put you in contact with somebody for uh, sudden oak death uh, in the, the live oaks out there, but the bur oak blight. So again, the complicating factors, so we've got stresses on the tree, then we've got bur oak blight. Um, so con continually the tree is not producing the food that it should, and that eventually uh, takes away from the stored resources that the tree has, and which opens it up to other stressors like uh, the two-line chestnut borer. Two-line chestnut borer is a native insect, and our trees generally have some decent defenses against it. However, if those defenses are weakened or the tree's uh, reserves are weakened, this is oftentimes the bug that's going to polish off a tree that's been stressed year after year through, uh, through drought or through uh, things like burrow oak. And two-line chestnut borer, again, it's in the same family as emerald ash borer. I showed a picture of a very early leaf stage there on the right. Uh, this is when the trees are just leafing out. And this is kind of what we look for when we're looking at the trees that might have indications that they've been attacked by two-line chestnut borer. Oftentimes it'll start by branch dieback, and terminal branch dieback near the tips, and you can see the dead branches uh, around tips. And so when people are managing fur oak blight, they're also looking for insect damage from two-line chestnut borer. And uh, other things like decay, fungi, root rot fungi, things like that. But two-line chestnut borer is something you can manage while you're managing the fungal issue too. Uh, it's not something I would treat every tree with an insecticide for two-line chestnut borer if I'm treating for burrow flight, but I would look for symptoms that the tree has been attacked. And uh, if it has, then I would also prescribe a insecticide treatment after the fungicide treatment. So what you're looking for is, is terminal dieback, usually branch dieback. Sometimes you'll even see the exit holes from the borers on the main trunk. They're not as aggressive as emerald ash borers, so even if they get into the tree, generally speaking, it takes them a lot longer to polish it off. But um, uh, you can look for those D-shaped exit holes that are similar to emerald ash borer exit holes. Again, it's not just the bur oak blight problem, but two-line chestnut borer is probably an underdiagnosed issue with oak trees. Um, it's fairly specific to oaks. And uh, a lot of times you can pinpoint an issue back to two-line chestnut borer. So, that's the guy that's going to come in and kind of work on that tree after it's stressed here. So again, the impact is not just in your landscape backyard trees, but there's a lot of people that are interested in protecting trees, even in rural oak groves, uh, rural urban interfaces. Oftentimes, golf courses are carved throughout uh, native baroque stands. Uh, and then, of course, there's the metro areas with the landscape trees. Uh, you know, again, we've treated trees in, in farmyards, in pastures, all different kinds of places where people are free. Um, there are other issues uh, on oak trees, as I mentioned earlier, that there's, they're very commonly stressed due to compaction root changes, soil grade changes, anything like that. Uh, so it's not always, if you see a tree that has um, brown leaves, it's not always bur oak blight. They're, always, they're also susceptible to a disease called anthracnose. That's actually a white oak that I picture there, um, with anthracnose, but uh, uh, bur oaks can get anthracnose. Anthracnose is a simpler leaf spot disease that's not as nearly as, as uh, severe as bur oak blight, but that could be a possibility. Uh, bur oaks are susceptible to oak wilt uh, disease, and uh, uh, usually on a white oak or a bur oak, oak wilt won't kill a tree all at once, so you might also have oak wilt in a bur oak, white oak, and again, culturing out that pathogen 
if you have any doubts what it is, it is an important thing to do. Um, uh, bacterial leaf scorch, if that's a big issue down in the uh, kind of the southern end of my area, not so much in the northern, but that might be a possibility, and that can affect oaks. Oftentimes it does affect red oaks. So but uh, I guess the point is that it, if you have problems with your oak trees, it's not 100% slam dunk, but it's a baroque oak. So there's some other maladies that might might affect it, so make sure that you do have uh, a plan to get that pathogen cultured out if, if you have any doubts. So get into management. Um, so what do we do? So we know we have bur oak trees that have bur oak blight, and uh, we know we have customers that are concerned about them, or that are concerned about them. So I put together a good, better, and best treatment protocol. Again, I've been working pretty hard on this for like four years, and so I figured out what works and what doesn't work. I'm not a plant pathologist. The research has been done in uh, Iowa State, and, and uh, the fungicide treatments have been done. However, I'm more of a practical application experience, and I've got several different service providers throughout my area that have been working on this pretty hard over the last few years. And so we kind of figured out what works, what doesn't work, and kind of share that with you. Um, so good, better, best treatment protocol. I'm going to go through each one individually. Propozole trunk injection in spring. So fungicide, we know it's a leaf spot disease. We know that... Um, uh, fungicides affect leaf spot diseases, so uh, how do you get that fungicide in the tree to protect that tree? And all the research that's been done has uh, been centered around trunk injection. Uh, again, these trees are very large, and foliar sprays really, it's a very impractical uh, methodology, uh, combined with the fact that the, the disease can be uh, prevalent throughout the summer. So it would be quite an intensive spray program. So honestly, nobody that I know does foliar sprays to manage this. So trunk injection of uh, propozole in the spring would be the, the, uh, the first step. Uh, again, I talked about this, but um, uh, timing of the treatments is very, very critical. This is what we've learned with the experience over the last several years. The timing is the most important part of this problem. So that's why I timed this webinar when I did. Basically, we are right now getting into the oak blight treatment season uh, over the next I would say week to 10 days where I live, and it's going to be different everywhere. It's probably already in Missouri. It's probably uh, already the prime of the treatment season. But the leaves will start coming out on the trees. Buds will start breaking. That's when we want to begin treatment. It's absolutely critical. Um, so that's the most Im important thing. If you, if you do your treatments too late, oftentimes you're not going to find success. So I was very er worried that we were going to do fungicide treatments so early on such undeveloped leaves. Uh, and I'm going to talk about the phytotoxicity issue. Uh, basically, I was worried that you'd cause damage to those tender leaves. However, we're not seeing that. We're seeing the earlier the treatments, the more effective treatments. Uh, again, you can see when we're doing these treatments, uh, the one up picture on the left is actually quite an early, early treatment. So you can see there's no leaves on the tree. The buds have just broken, and uh, those tend to be the most successful treatments. So we're using a trunk injection of uh, propanazole. Propanazole is 14.3% propanazole. Again, it's labeled for a wide variety of things, uh, and tabaki is on that label. But uh, it's also labeled for, for turf and, and uh spray applications, but we are talking about trunk injection for this application. We're using microinfusion device, the one in the center, this one here. That is a F12 uh, system which holds one and a half liters of solution and can inject into several different injection sites. Uh, it's much, much faster than the macroinfusion system. So folks have tried Baroque light treatments with the macroinfusion system and have had very, very limited success in the product. And so the microinfusion is definitely the, the way you want to go as far as productivity when you're doing treatments on trees that barely have leaves. And the the, uh, the rates that you want to use is you want to use 10 milliliters of propozole per diameter inch, and you want to mix two to three parts water. If you can get three parts of water into the tree, uh, I would suggest that. But most folks, uh, because the applications can be a little bit slow, they'll go with two parts for having that's two parts. The 10 milliliters of propozole is a real critical uh, number because um, 
you don't you do want to avoid phytotoxicity, which I'll talk about in a second. There's people that do put in up to the highest label rate, which is 20 milliliters per However, with fir oak trees, you will find that it will cause phytotoxicity in any situation. In other words, you're going to burn leaves off the trees if you're going over 10 mils. We find that we're getting control at 10 milliliters per inch and not having that phytotoxic. Uh, you determine the number of injection sites that you're injecting into the base of the tree by dividing the diameter at breast height divided by two. So a 20-inch tree would have 10 injection sites. 24-inch tree would have 12. Uh, most successful treatment system uh, has been the F-series microinfusion device with a one and a half liter bottle. That way you can use fewer bottles on a tree. So if you do the math and you're doing a 20-inch tree at 10 milliliters per diameter inch plus two parts water, that's 30 milliliters of solution into uh, each diameter inch times 20. That's at least 600 milliliters of solution. And that's going to go into 10 injection sites, which you can do all that on. And again, six lines will come off each bottle, but you can expand that out of this center port to have up to 12 lines coming out of one bottle. And the two on the side of each uh, port, you can actually remove. And so you could do 10 lines with, uh, with one bottle, 12 lines, eight lines. Uh, you have a lot of flexibility in the number of lines. OK, so microinfusion, doing them very early, shortly after bud break, until the last date that you want to do your treatments really would be right around Memorial Day or a little sooner. Again, I'm generalizing, and every year it's different. This year we tend to have a little bit later spring, so leaf out might be a little later. But you're talking about you've got about a three to four week window from the time the tree starts to leaf out till they harden up and the temperatures get warm. The temperature is actually your, your, your enemy in the, the phytotoxicity. So when it gets warm and you're putting in even a 10 milliliter inch rate, uh, you can cause phytotoxicity on bird oaks. As you see in my, my hand there, there's scorched leaves, and that, that is caused by phytotoxicity. Last year, I had many applicators doing the treatments, and uh, all of them had great success, even with small leaves. You might cut some small leaves when you do the treatment, but you aren't going to cause any uh, browning unless it gets warm. And so the very last week of treatment season for a couple warm days, a couple of them called me and said they had a couple jobs left to do. Should I get out and do that treatment? I said no. <laughs> and, and a few did them anyway. And so you can cause some leaf drop. However, you're not going to kill the tree, generally speaking. It's going to be uh, a leaf, leaf drop. The tree may re-leaf out in that situation. It might not. But uh, it's basically the leaf's response to the fungicide moving into the tree and the temperature gets warm and so the, the leaf will drop, scorch and drop. Again, I don't want to scare you if you're doing the treatments between bud break and, and uh, that Memorial Day time frame and the temperatures are not in excess of, say, 85 degrees, you're going to have success. Again, you may cup some leaves, turn them into a little bit of cup, uh, but they grow through it. They're very rapidly growing at that time. So I just avoid that excessive heat, and generally that comes in toward the Okay, the better good, better, best, the better treatment, in addition to the propozole trunk injection in spring, which is uh, basically a three, four week window to get your fungicide into the tree. Uh, also a growth regulator, tree growth regulator during any time during the growing season has shown great results on these oak trees. Usually these trees are to the size that people want them. And what a tree growth regulator does is it actually changes uh, the way that the tree grows. It basically reduces the shoot growth and puts that energy in thickening up the, the cell walls on the leaf and also into uh, root development, fibrous root development. And so uh, by doing that, what you're doing is you're increasing the tree's ability to cope with the disease. It's not necessarily a fungicide. It is more uh, basically uh, a growth regulator which helps the tree manage its stresses. And in this case, the stress is the leaf spot. So uh, also Highly recommend that plant growth reg tree growth regulator, short stop treatment, and you can do that any time during the growing season. Um, it's not limited to that springtime. You're going to get three years of growth regulation out of a single tree uh, in, in our latitude, generally speaking. As you get farther south, that might be a two-year 
uh, result. Basically, you're going to have two years of growth regulation, but uh, where I live, it's going to be kind of the three years, Minnesota, Iowa kind of uh, area. It's going to be about three years of regulation is going to occur. So you have to know that the tree species in this case, it's a burr oak, uh, measure it four and a half feet off the ground, and then determine the rate based on the chart that's on our website. I'll show you that. And then uh, basically it can be applied through the soil in either uh, injection or uh, basal drench. And this is that rate chart. If you look on the chart, you'll find oak. And then the chart tells you um, basically if you look at a 20-inch diameter the tree, that's the number of total milliliters of solution. And again, the chart tells you 11 parts water, one part sharp stuff, and that total solution. So in this case, it would be something on the neighborhood of 250 milliliters of sharp stuff and 2,700 milliliters of water. And so follow these rates. It's really important that you follow the rates because if you're using a growth regulator that's going to last three years. You want to make sure you're applying the correct amount and not over applying. Uh, if you do over-apply, you can cause leaves to be smaller than normal. Uh, and if you're under-applying, you're not going to get the results. That you want. So make sure you use that feature. Again, this is a secondary uh, treatment in addition to the fungicide treatment. Oftentimes, when we're dealing with burnt oak blight, we get called when the tree looks bad. You know, you're looking at the tree in July or August, and uh, that's when we, the customer calls us and say, you know, can you do anything? And uh, the answer is, we're going to schedule a fungicide treatment next spring. However, uh, we can do a growth regulation treatment uh, this summer to get that process started. I'm not going to get into real in-depth on growth regulation, but uh, in this case for burrow flight, it's a good, uh, good additional treatment to give you the tree more energy to um, fight off the stresses that burrow flight causes. makes it a little bit healthier to develop uh, thicker leaves so that that leaf spot is not and then you would follow that up with that propozole treatment the next spring. Uh, next step would be just to monitor as you're looking at these trees and deciding, okay, going out and made the, tree, the trees that had baroque flight last year, we we'll take a look and see if we see some of that terminal die back on uh, uh, some of the branches. We're going to look for insect activity. In those trees, I do recommend a follow-up treatment of uh, insecticide. And you can use the same injection sites you just um, uh, are going to uh, put in the fungicide, and then you're going to follow that up with an insecticide treatment. So again, you're looking for tip dieback. Oftentimes, you're out there early leaf stage, so you're looking for some of these types of Anytime there's additional stress from compaction, things like that, and you see a lot of this tip dieback, epicarp branching, a lot of times that's a very good indicator it's got too much of these trees all would be candidates for both fungicide treatment and the insecticide treatment. So triage, uh, triage, triage G4, or Imaget are all effective against two-line chunks before. Again, do not mix the products in with the fungicide using the same injection site, however, after the fungicide is done, go ahead and apply the proper rate of well, the insecticide treatment. And then the final step is just to manage the stresses on the trees. Again, if you're working in populated areas where there's a lot of soil compaction, parks, um, golf courses, things like that, uh, even yards, uh, a lot of the pictures I've shown are from, from lake areas where there are lake homes and, and 14, 15 trees on a lake property. And so there's competition. There's turf fertilizers that are being applied um, at high salt contents. You know, if, if there's a drought situation, salt can build up that can affect root systems as well. So we try to relieve as many of the stresses on the trees as possible, and that's your best treatment for so, itself. Um, again, maintaining adequate soil moisture. Usually they're growing in well-drained sites, so that's usually an issue, is if it's a well-drained site that you have dry that uh, you need to do some supplemental irrigation uh, or use products that will reduce the watering and, and still provide an environment for, for soil moisture. Uh, lower salt content or fertilizers, uh, we do fertilize our, our turf an awful lot, and that does affect the resistance and hopes are very sensitive to that. You know, enhanced soil microbial activity, there are products on the market that you can use to, to do that. The salts can kind of kill the, kill the soil, and you can 
enrich that. Uh, managing turf and trees together, uh, not often that easy. They're kind of natural enemies, and so if you have that capability, that does manage the, uh, the root environment as well. Minimize compaction and then judicious pruning uh, when, when necessary. There are products that do enhance the soil and uh, also create a uh, good soil moisture environment. One is our product, Nutrut, against soil supplies, uh, water management, fertilizer system, humic acids, kelp, uh, also a, a molecule that coats the roots and, uh, in fact, it attracts water molecules from the soil so, to make it so you don't have to water as often. Well. Keeps an adequate soil moisture environment. So all those kinds of things can help to reduce the, the stresses on the trees. Managing turf and trees, sometimes it's very difficult to do in conjunction. And this will enhance the soil environment without, um, uh, you know, it'll enhance the turf environment as well. So uh, definitely recommend if you can, you know, the Cadillac approach is apply the fungicide treatments, uh, do the growth regulator to manage the stresses, to, you know, monitor for insect damage. And then if you can do all those things, you're going to have the most Having said that, I, you know, your success rates for burrow flight aren't as good as emerald ash. I mean, there's no doubt that many times we're, we're called the trees that have a lot of stresses on them. And uh, we can't be magicians. So we can do everything right. And if we apply the fungicide in the right time of the year and the tree is healthy enough to accept the fungicide, we do a growth regulation. All these types of things re reduce stresses on the tree, monitor for insects. Uh, that are going to polish off the tree. We do all those things. You have a good chance of improving the overall health of that tree. On average, I'm thinking 70, 75% success rates. Where you see some failures are if the tree is very unhealthy. In the, the case of a tree that might have a root rot fungi or some decay, and it's not moving water. Uh, so that means it's not distributing the fungicide. Work. So there's indicators of that as well. Fruiting bodies near the the, the root system. So you have to kind of educate your customer, if there's a customer up there, your trees, you have to understand that this isn't just an uh, instant turnaround. You can improve the condition of that tree. Oftentimes you're going to have, six, you know, 70% of the time you're going to have good success reducing growth flight through the fungicide treatment. Uh, the tree will look better the next year. Um, however, you know, sometimes you have to throw more management at that tree to, to get the improvement. And I didn't put it in here, but I'm often asked, you know, is this a recurring treatment? Do I have to retreat every single year? And the answer that Dr. Tom Harrington from Iowa State always says is basically he's the, the prime researcher on this issue. Is he says, do the treatments, monitor the following year, and uh, do not retreat until symptoms reoccur. I think that's a good answer. Basically, you're looking at improvement on the year after. If the tree is improved, you don't need to schedule a treatment uh, for the next year. Um, and then as the symptoms might reappear, then you can then you can retreat that tree. But if you take this approach where you're trying to improve the overall health of the tree, uh, you shouldn't have to do a fungicide treatment year after year after year. But basically, you have to monitor that summer to see uh, see what the results of your fungicide treatment are and and uh, if you need to retreat. So. Uh, that's it in a nutshell. Again, it's not a widespread national issue. It's kind of a regional issue, as I indicated. So I know that there is a limited uh, audience for this, but I do have a lot of people that are interested. I thought it would be a real good pertinent webinar. Hopefully you got something out of it, but uh, please feel free to ask questions. We have some time here if you want to jump in and put in the chat, chat box any question. A little bubble up on the top. You can certainly uh, ask any questions that you like. There is a question. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, um, again, uh, Angel has a question. Uh, uh, I took care of Angel. I sent him Don's information already. <clears throat> All those things are good. Uh, good practice. Cleaning tools between the pruning cuts on a leaf spot disease is probably unlikely to spread the uh, spread the leaf spot disease. However, oftentimes we are working in trees that potentially can be 
that case, the detective uh, recruiting tools and became cuts at a very, very good level. Thank you. Yes. Any other questions? All right, nice hey, job. Uh, I don't know, Zach, do you have any comments? Uh, no, I was just going to say nice job today, Jeff. Thanks for taking the time. Uh, glad it's, you know, you're not buried under four feet of snow anymore up there in, uh, in your home. Uh, so, yeah, again, we had some spring weather, so I've talked to go. several of the borough blight treatment folks, and uh, they're anxious. They're hoping, uh, usually it's next week, the first week of May that they're out, but this this case might be the week after, but um, yeah. we're, you know, we're catching up. Excellent, excellent. Well, uh, thanks, everyone, for coming today. Again, uh, it was recorded, so uh, this will be available on the ArborJet YouTube page and the ArborJet website come the end of this week. Uh, so if you want to watch it again or, or send any of your coworkers or uh, employees or anyone to it, uh, feel free to, to share it and let them know. Uh, next week, we have Emmett down in our South Central area. He's going to be giving a, a talk on chlorosis. Uh, and we were able to apply early enough for an ISA credit. So next week, we'll, Chlorosis will be able to have an ISA credit for any of those attending. Um, so check back on the ArborJet website or Facebook page uh, to get some more details. Thanks, everyone. Bye.